The most prominent characteristic that gives shape to digital communication is uh, the network structure itself. Uh, and that is very important to understand uh, because the entire internet, well, is a net, is a network between nets. And on top of that physical infrastructure, we also created a software information infrastructure that also works with a network structure. So we have all these different data points on the internet. And then somebody called Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 came up with the idea, why don't we connect these data points with links? We call them hyperlinks. And uh, that gives a rise to a bunch of interesting phenomena that you can innovate. And that a lot of innovations have happened in the more than three decades since then. So I invite you to please check out this video about Tim Berners-Lee and his genius idea of creating the World Wide Web on top of the internet. It's important that we distinguish the internet and the World Wide Web, and both of them have a network structure. The combinations of this physical network structure, the internet and the data network structure, the hyperlinked World Wide Web, gives rise to what, again, my, the doctoral father of my, of my second PhD, Professor Gastels, calls the space of flows. And I, I strongly invite you to read, especially the first one. It's from, it's from 1996, but it's very interesting uh, to understand. And there he summarized the dynamics that were going on, the societal changes from the 70s to the 90s. And you could already see the rise of how society reorganized according to a network structure. So in the digital age, it's really important to understand the shape of networks and the traditional grid, which is basically a square, like how we have traditionally maps and map out space when we, when we measure space, this two by two well, grid is just one possible network structures. Networks almost never come in a grid. They come in all kind of uh, shapes and sizes, and then we can analyze the geography of it by well seeing what's connected to what. So every node here, for example, could be a human. In that case, it is a human. And the link can be some of kind of social relationship that they have. And then you can come up with all kinds of characteristics. So these words that we often use when we do social analysis, like gatekeeper, broker, intermediary, bottleneck, amplifier. And so, so they all have a very concrete mathematical definition in network science. So network science is really a science. For example, you could ask the question, what's the center of a network? Now, if it would be a grid, then you say like, well, the center is if you have the same distance you know, to all, to all the, the edges, to all the rims, the center of a circle, for example. And you can do the same thing in a network. You can say, well, who is in the center of a network? Who's the most central person? You can say, well, the person that's closest to all the other members of this social network. And you can count that, well, from this person to go to this person is so much. And that is a mathematical term, it's called the closeness centrality. Now, but that might not what matters in your digital network. You could also say, well, in the center is the one with the most connections, the most connected person in the social network. That's called the degree centrality. And that might not necessarily be the same person, but it, this person might diffuse information. It has a more important role when it comes to diffusing information as, for example, an amplifier, as you can see here. So this acts as an amplifier or, or this voice here. These uh, have high degree centrality. You could also ask, what is the node in the network that has to be passed through most often? When everybody else wants to connect to everybody else, then you know information travels through this network. So what is a critical, you can call this a bottleneck, an intermediary, and there are differences between them. Well, if you want to learn more about that, again, today's uh, <laughs> shameless plug, I, uh, I promote my other courses here a little bit. So I have an entire course uh, also on Coursera available and at the University of California. Uh, when you're there, it's part of the computational social science 
uh, course and, and specialization on Coursera where you can learn social network analysis. Um, and it's, it's, it's not so long. I think it's, it's about four, four, three or four hours of lectures where you can learn how to calculate these kind of things. And it's very important. So I'm not going to bore you going more into details about that here that you understand network structure because what matters, Castells, Professor Castells calls it the space of flows. So if you want to understand space in the digital realm, you have to see where information flows. And information is bound by the structure of the underlying network. Now, that can be a physical structure, the internet, it can be the World Wide Web, or it can be just the connection on social medias you have. So the space of what you see in social media is defined by the connections you have there. Networks can also have externalities. What do we mean by network externalities? That's important to understand. Well, uh, that goes back to a book, and I, sh I show you the old, I find myself showing you the old classics today. Information Rules, a very influential book from 1999. So these are the books that I first studied when I got into this field by Shapiro and Varian, uh, professors at UC Berkeley here at our university. And Varian moved on after this book and became the magician behind the, curricle, uh, behind the curtain uh, of Google and helped to build basically their marketing system. So you really understand the, the rules of information and that information rules. So that's the, there's this book, very influential and important books that tells, uh, told us early on some of these traits that I also today show. And one of the traits, many others as well, one of them that, they, that I learned from them, that's why I cited here, is uh, the network externalities and how influential they are. So what they say is, when the value of a product to one user depends on how many other users there are, economists say that this product inhibits network externalities or network effects. So, okay, so what do they mean by that? Okay, so the value of a product depends on how many users there are. All right, so traditionally we have an Apple and we have two users. Now, now, the value of the Apple is cut by half if I have two users instead of one user. Now, what if I would have four users? Well, if I'm fair, then the value is actually now cut by four. Each one gets a quarter of the Apple. So this is called negative network externalities. The law of scarcity, extremely important to understand how the economy works and why the economy works, why it works. So supply and demand and all that adjustment that's going on and that every company, but most of employers are after that has to do with the law of scarcity at the end, theoretically. That has to do with negative network externalities. The more people use it, well, the demand goes up and then well, hopefully the supply has to catch up. Now, funny enough, what Shapiro and Varian explained to us back then is that in information, when it comes to information and to the digital, we don't have negative network externalities, we have positive network externalities. So that's a funny thing. That means positive network externality means that the value of the product increases the more users there are. And that really, like, really baffled economists because that's not how they think. So the more user there are, the more valuable, so the more people try to eat the apple, the more valuable the apple gets. Like, how is that like, how, like, how, like that doesn't really compute. So let me show you an example. Well, if you have one telephone, uh, Graham Bell had the first telephone in 18, what was it, 1870 something, 76 if I remember correctly. Now that wasn't very useful with this one telephone. What could he do? Well, he got another telephone and called his, his assistant, uh, Watson, and he said, Mr. Watson, come here, uh, I need you. So that was the first word uttered through a telephone. And that was useful because Watson could call Bell and Bell could call Watson. Cool, so we have two connections, right? An arrow here, he could call Bell and Bell could call Watson. Now, what if they would add a third telephone? Well, now they can make already six calls. Well, they can make one, two, three, four, five, six calls. Well, that's useful. What if we add a fourth one? Well, now we can make 12 calls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. It doubled. Now, what if we add a fifth one? Now we can make 20 calls. Well, it doesn't really double all of the time. The, the basically, it doesn't grow. It grows exponentially, but it's x squared minus x because here we assume it doesn't create additional value to call yourself. That's why I have to take the x away. And feel free to, to, to map it out and, and count through that. It's, it's, it's very instructive. But what it says here is the more users use the telephone, the more valuable it is for me because in the beginning I could only call one other person. Now I can call you know, 
20, they may, can make 20 calls, I can call 20 people. And the same uh, applies to databases. The more databases you connect, the more valuable it is because you can make ah, new combinations, you get into that. So uh, you can combine more, you have then come exponentially more uh, combinatorial possibilities. And we will talk much more about that later. So I'm getting ahead of myself. But that's the idea. Now, so when you have then a big network and you're part of this big network, you get exponentially more value out of it. That's why it's so difficult to kick the big platforms off their throne, because I get exponentially more value out of being on a platform that has many users. So if I join a social network or a service that has many users, then you know, most of my friends will be there and I have exponentially more value. So for a new network to come in and kick this big established network of the throne is extremely difficult because you're fighting against exponentials. Um, and that leads me to the next point. We need to understand the powers of exponentials, which are very important um, in, in networks. And that has to do with the term of interoperability. So interoperability, then I have to make sure that all my different network members can talk to each other. So if we would be in a social network, well, hopefully we speak the same language because otherwise it would be difficult to talk to each other. And so also, machines need to speak the same language if I want to connect them. Now, what are some of the network implications? And I could go completely into interoperability now, which is a very important subject um, because I need to connect all these different machines and not all of them will necessarily speak the same language. But now let's stay at the network level. We talked about networks, so let's talk about the network aspects of interoperability. I have in my company different softwares, information systems, and you already know them. We talked about that in previous lecture, ERP, SEM, CRM. I don't have to uh, explain what they mean. You know that. If not, please go back and invite you uh, to, to look at the previous lectures. Now I have to connect all of them. What my supply chain has to do with my customer relationship management, with my enterprise resource planning. So I already need like six connections here and I connect them. Great. So now they can all talk to each other and I can create the, the, the data between them. I can create big data. I need to connect that in real time, the communication. Now, I have something new, of course. You want to do the machine learning thing with Azure from Microsoft or Amazon Web Services, Amazon Cloud. And of course, you need to include the cloud and the, the, the machine learning into it, right? And now I have already a bunch of more connections. And each one of these errors when you work in companies, and as I said, as a, in, in, as a consultant, I often work with companies, each one of these connections, some other kind of engineering consultant, they will charge a lot to connect these different different systems, information systems. And now you connect something else, some legacy systems that might be a little bit more, more antique and you have to connect them too. And at the end, you make a connection and connection and you buy one new software and you have to connect them with the connector and it just, it gets, it gets too much. But you need to take advantage of the positive network externality. So you want to connect these. It doesn't have to be people to your network. In this case, you have to connect softwares to your network. So how can you actually scale on the interoperability of all these different connections? Well, network science to the rescue. And as I said, I'm not gonna, I would love to, I'm really tempted to go into deep into network science right now and network analysis right now, but we will keep it simple. One, very important insight from network science is if you want to efficiently connect many different nodes with each other, you create what is known as a hub and spoke network or what you call a star network. I often call it the star network, which is much more efficient. It has one intermediary step, but it's much more efficient than a point to point network. So here you can see the hub and spoke network structure. It's hub and spoke because the wheel looks like a hub and spoke wheel. And this is the point to point connection. That's what I did in the previous slide. So let's compare both of them. So here the red one is the, is the direct connection. It grows, as I said, with the network externality equation, x squared minus x. And then here I have the star formation. It, let's see how that grows if I create a hub and spoke network. So first of all, I have one software here, and now I connect a second one of that. Well, that's how it starts. Then when, that's when, when organizations fall into that trap. They connect the first one. It's like, oh, it's kind of like the same. I might as well directly connect them. But then they connect the second one, and with the star network, I need four connections. One, two, three, four. 
When I connect them directly, we already counted that, it's six, one, two, three, four, five, six connections. So I need more connections, six connections versus four connections. Both of them have three nodes. So here on the X axis, I count the number of nodes and here I count the number of required connections. Let's see what happened with a fourth, if I wanna add a fourth information system to my network. Well, here I connected, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six connection now with the star network and with the point to point network, I already have 12, One, two, we counted that before. And I can keep on going and you will see at the end that the number of connections for the point to point network, given network externality grows exponentially that's the value of positive network externality, but that's the problem <laughs> for somebody who wants to design the system for your organization and wants to scale on that system. However, if I do a hub and spoke network with a star in the middle, it's called a star, then uh, you have linear growth. So this grows linear and this grows exponential. And you know, once you compare, so I know some of you might be into these kind of things, mathematical, or if you come from the natural sciences, you know you don't mess with the powers of exponentials. You, you, you really, you don't want to, it gets, just, it gets just too much. And you can keep on going in some companies I've been consulted with, I mean, I can show them, they have about 30 different information systems. And I said, well, we have to all connect them in order to do the big data and the machine learning. And if you project it, you get up to a thousand connections. So that's just like, no. But if you create a centralized network here, a star network and connect to them, you can scale that linearly. Now, it's very important to mention that here you have an intermediary step, whereas here you can connect directly, that's the benefit, directly from each system to each system. Here you go through an intermediary step, you need an extra step in order to go from here to here, you have to go through the, the hub in the network. But that's also a benefit. Well, first of all, that scales. And, you know, for example, airline networks have grown organically like that. So that's why you always have to stop in LAX or in Florida or in, in whatever when you, when you change airplanes, because not every city connects to every city. Actually, airline networks, they go by hub and spoke network. You fly to this and then you reconnect. So you have one layover. And that is not like a mastermind plan that, that is just how it's organically grown. It's just the star network is extremely more efficient. If you take that other course I'm teaching, I'm really going in detail and show you the benefits. We be working through some, we pull up our sleeves and work through some maths and understanding the power of, of, of this kind of network design. And you have to design the network that, that fits, your, fits your case. Now it also has benefits because here in the hub, I can just like plug and play any new system. And in the hub, in the star, I can have my big data. So if I go back to my, that's also from a previous lecture. If you, if you just join us right now, I invite you to go back and watch these lectures. If I wanna create my digital organization, I have all these different systems here, information systems. And back then I basically presented you a star network without even justifying why it is a star. Well, because here in the central server, I have my big data. That's when it all comes together. And trust me, you work with these organizations, it's a headache to convince them to create a star network. Because you know, I have a vice president over here and I have another vice president over here and another VP over here and another, and it's very, you know, they, they don't want to give up to like, who do you do here? Is that a new vice presidency? You change, you change this, you change the, the organizational structure of the company. You really do. And uh, there's a lot of cultural resistance. So like most of the work is not, I mean, the math speaks for itself. Exponentials compared to linear, there's no question where you have to go. But most of the work of this consultancy work that I'm then involved in is basically more you know, cultural, cultural change. Now, you need that because at the end, based on that big data source on this, uh, on this data hub or lake that you have here, you create, well, what we call then this platform there where you can do your machine learning and where you can do uh, your computer simulations. And we have talked about the, we already talked in previous sessions and previous lectures about the power of machine learning and computer simulations and digital twins and the metaverse. So in order to have the digitalization, sending the information up in order then to have the goal of doing the algorithmification the way down, you need some kind, something like a hub and spoke network if you want to make it scalable. And then once you have that, whatever new technology comes your way in the future, and there will surely be some new software or some new thing, then you don't have this new software and you have to connect it to all the other ones. You just 
plug it into the hub. You plug it into the star. And the same, it's, you know, it's similar of how your mobile phone works. So it's just like if you have a new software, you just like download the app. And that's how you can think about that. Basically, your, your phone operating system, operating system is the hub. And you upload a new data, you download a new app, and then you install it and you can make it interoperable with the others as well. But you need this kind of central hub. And it's really surprising that this is not really done in most of the organizations that, that, that you encounter. Our last digital communication trade refers to what I call media original selection. It becomes extremely important the more and more we go into the virtual reality future. But it's a pretty old theory here from the 1980s, and I show you the old classics today. Uh, Lengel and Daft coined that phrase of media richness. And basically, let me break it down. It, basically, what they're saying is the complexity of the information that you want to communicate should determine what kind of media you want to use. And the media is the message famously here in, in the science of communication. So if you have an information with a very low complexity, you just want to communicate the result of a sports game because somebody was betting on it. And all the interest, they're not even interested how they played or if it was a beautiful game or a nice game or a game with a lot. No, they just want to know the end result score because they were betting some money on it. Well, then you probably don't have to send them a four hour video recording of the entire game, including extra time. You just send them you know, the two numbers and say, well, that's how the game ended. If you would send them the big video of everything, that would be an informational overkill, basically. You don't need a medium with such high complexity if you have low complexity information. However, if you have a high information complexity if you need to see, for example, people's facial expression and so forth, then you know you shouldn't just send a text message. There are some messages we all have to remember that there are some things you don't you don't just text. You just you pick up the phone and call or you make a video conference or in the best case, even if it takes a few days, you see that person, you see that other person in person. Like Honestly, there's a, because there are some things communicated that even a video conference cannot communicate. So, and we all know that intuitively. So information richness theory basically pits these two uh, information complexity and the complexity of a medium against each other. And we have known for many years that it matters. So when you go to a job interview and I show the hiring, the hiring uh, uh, agent just a transcript of what's going on, well, they will evaluate the intellect of the person much lower than if they see a video recording. And the audio recording is somewhere in the middle. But you know, it goes to show that the medium is the message. So if you go to a job interview, <laughs> you follow this study, well, hopefully they invite you in person. You have much higher chances to, to, to impress them, right? Just don't, don't only like send a transcript of, of, of what you have to say. And this is, of course, becoming extremely important. The more we expand our two-dimensional information frameworks into three-dimensional information frameworks and call it the metaverse or whatever you want to hear. Again, the CEO and founder of Facebook, CEO and founder of, of Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, he, he's talking a lot about how actually our 3D virtual reality will change also the media richness. And here are several examples. And for example, so when you're in the metaverse, when you're in a VR space, you can choose. Here, Mr. Zuckerberg, <laughs> he, he always wears the same things every day, makes his life simple, and that's fantastic. But then in the metaverse, maybe he can become, well, he wouldn't wear something else in real life, but maybe there are some occasions where he wants to be an astronaut and that communicates something. So you want to show up as an avatar, you want to show up as an avatar that really presents yourself or doesn't present, or what aspects does it represent on yourself? What's the media richness selection and how do you fine tune the media richness in order to uh, also actually some exaggerate some media richness or do you think some things are actually more, more rather hidden and you have them plain vanilla. It's not really communicating something real about yourself. So we will discover, we don't really understand it yet. A lot of social science and communication research has to be done over the next decades to, to figure out the details of how a, a 3D environment will affect media richness selection.